Um, what I want to do is we have to understand Black Wall Street. We have to look at some events and, and the climate in America leading up to the altercation, the interaction, May 30th, 1921, that leads to the race riot taking place, okay? So I'm gonna run through some history quickly here, run through some timelines. Um, one of the things you're gonna find when you study this history is that um, you have a lot of negative depictions of African people in this country, which would allow a dehumanization to take place, where African people could be lynched and nobody arrested for it. They could be lynched, mutilated, things like this. Nobody arrested, nobody prosecuted. Business just goes on as usual, okay? Um, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. I deal with it uh, a lot more in uh, my series, The Media's Deliberate Destruction of the African American Family. If we go back and look at during the time of slavery, around 1828 to 1829, you're gonna have uh, a, a white entertainer named T.D. Rice, Thomas, Thomas D. Rice, okay? And he creates this character known as the Jim Crow character, all right? And he the, 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 there are a couple of different versions of the legend of how the Jim Crow character came about. But basically, he saw a, a slave, um, a, a, a black slave male, um, tended to animals and he was doing a dance, okay? And it was it became known as the Jim Crow dance. Um, and the song goes something like, turn around, jump around, and jump just so, every time I turn around, I jump Jim Crow. And what he did was, he put on tattered, torn clothing, uh, put on blackface, imitated a southern black dialect, and did this Jim Crow character. This became a big hit, and then you started having all these other white men doing the same thing. And T.D. Rice is known as the father of the minstrel shows, okay? If you go back and study, now this is before TV, before radio, the minstrel shows were like the, uh, the scandal of today. Everybody loved the minstrel shows. In the north, the south, it was a phenomenon, the minstrel show. And the minstrel shows what they would, uh, they would have white people in blackface imitating African Americans, um, uh, Afro wigs, things like that, uh, um, and they would uh, lampoon African Americans, showing them as being ignorant, simple, and, and white people love this, okay? This, this becomes huge entertainment. If you watch, um, how many people ever watch uh, episodes of the Long Ranger TV show that started in 1950? Ever watch that? It's on Hulu. You see a few episodes where they reference minstrel shows in there because the people are going to the minstrel shows. And what happened was, I, uh, I'm an old radio show fan, so I listen to old radio shows. I've been listening to old radio shows probably 30 years now. Um, and the Lone Ranger, the Green Hornet, and Sergeant Preston of the Yukon originated in Detroit, WXYZ Studios in Detroit. And if you listen, they have episodes on YouTube. If you actually listen to them, at the end of the episode, they say, this is coming out of WXY Studios and WXYZ Studios in Detroit. Well, um, a couple of years ago, I came across information about Bass Reeves. And Bass Reeves was an African American lawman, former slave. And I was coming across articles talking about a relationship between Bass Reeves and the Lone Ranger. Um, and this is even before Hidden Colors 3 came out. So I was doing research on this, and I used to do a segment in Detroit on WCHB Radio 1200 AM on the, the Angelo Henderson show. I did a segment every other week dealing with history, African American history, things like this. So we talked about Bass Reeves. And it's uh, when you study Bass Reeves, you see a striking resemblance between Bass Reeves and the Long Ranger. And it's believed that Bass Reeves was the real life inspiration for the fictional character of the Long Ranger. So being the investigative person that I am, I wanted to test that theory. So I watched all about 150 episodes of The Long Range in about three months on Hulu. I went through and said, and it's true, yeah. Because see, um, Bass Reeves used to give out silver dollars. The Long Range gives out silver bullets. Bass Reeves used to travel oftentimes with an Indian companion. We know The Long Range travels with Tonto. Um, Bass Reeves used to ride on a horse that was like a light colored horse, uh, but also, a lot of, he, he, he arrested 3,000 criminals, okay? He would oftentimes wear disguises so that he can infiltrate 
uh, the criminals' layers and where they are to gain information and arrest people. If you watch the Lone Ranger, you see oftentimes he wears disguises to get information on the criminal so he could arrest them. Then I did more research and I found that with Bass Reeves, um, a lot of the people who he arrested, they served in a prison in Detroit, Michigan. Well, Detroit, Michigan is where the Lone Ranger originates out of. Okay, so there's a lot, when you study that, there's a lot of resemblance between he and the Lone Ranger. But uh, in watching all uh, something, oh, it's five episodes of The Long Range. The first four episodes, four, five seasons. First four seasons are in black and white. Last season is in color. I saw references to minstrel shows in there. References to the Homesteaders, dealing with the Homestead Act of 1862, and then the Homestead Act of 18 Southern Homestead Act of 1866. But something interesting that I found, I didn't see any people of African descent in any of the five seasons of the Long Ranger, and this takes place out in the Old West, and one third of the cowboys were black. <laughs> None. None. I found that amazing. How do you do that? <laughs> I, I don't understand that. <laughs> All right, so, um, so check out, check that out. Check out the Long Ranger. Read about Bass Reeves. Um, actually, Hidden Colors 3, they talk about them. We have our table in the back and DVDs there. Uh, but when you get into this history and you start doing research and connecting the dots, which is surprisingly fun. All right, so we have TV Rice, 1828, Menstrual Father of the Menstrual Shows. From the Jim Crow character, you get other negative stereotypical images, the Sambo, the, the Sambo, the Coon, uh, the Uncle, things like this, okay? And what the South is trying to do, the South projects these images of the happy slave. The abolitionist movement over time gains steam. And the South is trying to justify slavery as being a good institution that benefits everybody. The slaves are happy, they love their masters, they cook the food, they pick the cotton. The masters are benevolent and good to the slaves. This produces, we send cotton up north to the textile mills and you know that provides jobs up there. So this is an institution that has checks and balances, okay? And they're, they're showing the image of the happy slave to show we're, we're taking good care of these Negroes. We provide a room and board, things like this. You have the uh, book in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe, which really exposes a lot of the atrocities to slavery. And, and Uncle Tom in the in the in the uh, novel, contrary to popular belief, he was the he was the good slave. He he he, the, the, he was the he was not what we call an Uncle Tom. Sambo was the one who followed behind the master and did the dirty work of the master, okay? Uncle Tom was a slave who was beaten to death uh, one night uh, by Sambo, the right-hand man of the, of, the, um, of the slave master, Simon Negri. So when Uncle Tom's cabin comes out, this exposes a lot of the atrocities of slavery to everybody, and not just in this country. It becomes an international bestseller. It sells 300,000 copies its first year. And it gets banned in the state of Maryland, which is where a man named Josiah Henson was from, who was the real life person that the character of Uncle Tom was based upon. Because he was a former slave who escapes to freedom and becomes a Methodist minister and an educator and uh, uh, helps operate the Underground Railroad and helps other uh, slaves gain their freedom. Uh, this episode of the Jeffersons. That's why I first found out about Josiah Henson back in the 70s. Um, it was Louise's uncle, I think it was, who was a butler, and George didn't like him because he said he talked proper and sedity and things like this, and uh, George called him Uncle Tom, and then the butler schooled him on who Uncle Tom really was, and Josiah Henson. That's an episode of the Jefferson. That's how I first found out about, you know, Josiah Henson. All right, so, 1828, we have T.D. Rice. 1830, we have the Indian Removal Act, which brings about the Trail of Tears. Any removal act removes um, Native Americans off their land in the southeastern uh, United States, like Florida, places like that. You're going to have the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Creek Indians, the Cherokee, the Seminole Indians being pushed off their land going out uh, west. A lot of them, all five, going to Oklahoma. Okay? So we have the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the Trail of Tears. What a lot of people don't know is all five civilized tribes of Native Americans also own black slaves. And he took that black slaves with him as well. We're going to get to that in just a minute. All right. Uh, the 1840s, negative images of Manny Sambos and Coons are created by the South to justify slavery in that era. 1849, Harry Tubman escaped from slavery in Maryland. 
Uh, we're talking about Harry Beecher Stowe. Okay, Dred Scott case, uh, 1857. Uh, we have uh, Justice Taney saying that a, um, a Negro doesn't have any rights that a white man is bound to respect. Uh, 1861, 1865, Civil War is fought. First um, uh, state to succeed from the Union, South Carolina, 1861. Then we follow by 10 other states. We have, um, when we look at the Trail of Tears, here's a map. Um, they're being pushed off their land in these areas like Florida, these areas you had the Choctaw here, Chickasaw here around 1832, Choctaw 1830, Creek Indians 1832, Cherokee 1835, Seminole Indians down here. You're going to have the Seminole Wars fought between the Seminole Indians and the U.S. because they don't want to get pushed off their land. Okay? Uh, and then they're all five civilized tribes. They go out into this area and they all go into Oklahoma. Okay? Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, Cherokee Indians. All right? Just to give you a little geography. All right, now, um, so we have the Civil War fought, 1861, 1865. During the Civil War, you're also going to have the Homestead Act of 1862. How many people are familiar with the Homestead Act of 1862? Homestead Act of 1862 gives 160 acres of land to white people who will take care of this land for five years. They can have it free. 160 acres of land. So you're going to have somewhere, estimates show somewhere between uh, about 400,000, 600,000 families to take advantage of this, almost all white. Some of them still have that land today. If you, uh, if you read, because uh, it's, it's handed down generation after generation. If you read the book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold History of American White Supremacy, I showed the book yesterday. How many people are familiar with that book? Anybody? That's a hell of a book. This is like, this is like black nigga white wealth on steroids because it's, it's very compact. It deals with all the laws and things like that uh, that help to shift wealth to the dominant white society. Okay, um, this this is put up by Nation of Islam Research Group and how white folks got so rich: the untold story of American white supremacy. Okay, this is like only eight dollars. I don't sell this. If you go to noi <coughs> noirg.org, you can order it there. Let me check with Vicky see if she can get it for you. This is the second edition. I just got this last weekend at the conference I was at. What, what, what was the website again? N-O-I? Oh, N-O-I-R-G dot org. Yeah, Nation of Islam Research Group. N-O-I-R-G dot org. Thanks. Okay. And uh, I, read the, I read the first edition, and it was fantastic. And I just found out last week there's a second edition, so I got that, man. And that, that's deep. It's only about, I mean, how many pages? It's very compact and uh, easy to read. It's like... Um, 132 pages, something like that, that you get to it very quickly. The Homestead Act of what? 1862. There's a Homestead Act of 1862. You have a, a Southern Homestead Act of 1866 after um, Civil War ends also. All right. Uh, okay. Okay, Homestead Act, give away free land. Black labor, white wealth, they talk about that also. 1865, April 14th, President Abraham Lincoln is shot. We have the 13th Amendment, uh, December 6, uh, 1865, which legally frees the slaves. And as we showed yesterday in the presentation, states that involuntary uh, slavery is uh, uh, prohibited unless duly convicted of a crime. Um, 1866, now, you have a few very, very important things that happened in 1866. Um, first of all, you had a National Labor Union created, all right? You're going to have some smaller labor unions in like the 1830s and 1840s, but the National Labor Union is a huge union. It's created right after slavery ends. As we talked about yesterday, you had up until 1865 about 262, at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African slaves had in this country. And those skills, trades, and crafts were used to build this country. Um, I think I have the, um, I think I showed it yesterday. I think I have it still with me because I have the trial for them. How many people did not see the information I showed yesterday dealing with the skills, trades, and crafts? Did you not see that? Okay. Um, so what happens is, is now that these former slaves can uh, compete with white men for jobs, and, they, and the slaves had the skills, because we were doing the jobs anyway, and oftentimes, we were better qualified mm -hmm. than Europeans. Now they're trying to protect their jobs, okay? So they create these labor unions and they have contracts with different industries mm -hmm. stating that you can only hire white men that belong to certain, certain unions. They're trying to push us out, trying to lock us out of these jobs. Okay, you can take a look at that. All right, so 
And then from 1866 to 1880, you have about 12 million European immigrants that come to this country. And a lot of the jobs that they got should have gone to us because we, we were the ones who were here doing the work all along. Okay? So, now, that's in 1866. Also in 1866, the Ku Klux Klan is created in Pulaski, Tennessee. Most sources, most, most sources, Sources show 1866. A few of them will show 1865. But the majority of them show 1866, Pulaski, Tennessee, after after the um, Civil War ends. Now, what a lot of people don't know about the Ku Klux Klan, a lot of people think that they were designed to terrorize the former slaves, African Americans. That's partly true. They were also attacking white Republicans who were allies to the former slaves. So, from about 1882 to 1964, you got about 3,400 black people who were lynched, but you got about 1,297 white people who were lynched also who were Republicans. Okay, and uh, so a lot of early on, a lot of Republicans. Later on, you know, some of them not. But the Ku Klux Klan, they were attacking, you know, African Americans, and they were attacking white people and Jews and Catholics also. Because to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan, their their bylaws stated that you had to be a white male Protestant. Gentile, okay, white male Protestant. You couldn't be Jewish, you couldn't be Catholic, things like this. And you had to be at least 16 years old. They didn't accept women, but, when, but in Oklahoma, they had an auxiliary group of white women who were um, uh, uh, an auxiliary of the Ku Klux Klan, okay? All right, so we had a Ku Klux Klan, 1866. Also, the eugenics movement, about 1867. How many people are familiar with, with eugenics? All right, now, so eugenics starts shortly after slavery ends also. Francis Galton coins, coins the term eugenics. The documentary, My Alpha 21, really breaks down the whole history of eugenics. Um, it's an attempt to weed out, eugenics means good genes, okay? It's an attempt to weed out um, genes that they determined would um, lead to people being criminals, lead to people being feeble-minded, uh, nimble seals, things like this, okay? <laughs> They're trying to weed out those genes. So, what they do is eventually from about 1927 to about 1978, you have about 31 state-sponsored eugenics programs in the U.S. that do forced sterilizations on people, okay? There were approximately 100,000 people in the U.S., white and African American, who had forced sterilizations done on them. Usually lower income people, things like this, people on welfare, what have you. Um, South Carolina, if I remember, if I remember correctly, South Carolina, um, either North Carolina or South Carolina. Um, that was the first state to acknowledge the state sponsored eugenics program and to push for reparations for their survivors. In my Alpha 21, the documentary, they talk about that in an interview assistant named Elaine Riddick who was uh, at the forefront of the push to get uh, reparations awarded to the survivors. There were about 1,800, approximately 1,800 survivors of South Carolina's uh, state-sponsored eugenics program, okay? So recently, a few months ago, they got awarded some type of reparations for this. But they would do forced sterilizations, and in the case of Elaine Riddick, what happened was she was about 13, she was pregnant, her grandmother was on welfare, her grandmother was illiterate, so, and the doctors told her that she had to sign this form authorizing them to sterilize Elaine Riddick, otherwise they would cut off her grandmother's welfare, okay? So she signed her ex and allowed them to do this, but, she, but Elaine Riddick did not know that she was sterilized until years later when she was trying to have another child, okay? So this is some deep history. This stuff happened here in the U.S. All right, now, 1866 to 1877, oh, no, oh, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger... Uh, was a eugenicist, a known eugenicist, and she created what's known as the American Birth Control League. Okay, and then in 1942, the American Birth Control League changed the name to Planned Parenthood. Okay, Planned Parenthood comes out of the eugenics movement. All right, and if you watch, if you watch the documentary Mom for 21, they they, they spent uh, three years doing the research for that documentary. It's, it, it, the, the documentary is put out by a right wing pro life group. The director's name is Mark Crutcher. I talked to him on the phone a couple of times when, when the documentary came out. And he told me the, all the research they went through, things like that, for it. And in the documentary, they also show you 
real newspaper articles about what was going on throughout the years. And I Googled some of those articles, I actually read them. They were real newspaper articles as well. All right, now, 1866 to 1867. So what was the, what's the name of that document? Ma'afa 21, M-A-A-F-A. Ma'afa 21, 21st century black genocide. All right, now, 1866 to 1877, we have reconstruction in the U.S., okay? So the South is totally destroyed. Plantations burned, bridges knocked out. The, 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 the South had about five billion, the, the plantation owners had about five billion dollars invested in the slaves. Now the slaves are free things like this, um, and you have Union troops in the South trying to um, protect the rights of the slaves, there, okay, the former slaves, all right? This is during the Reconstruction era. Um, during this period of time, you have African Americans being elected uh, as uh, senators, uh, elected to the House of Representatives. You have a few of us that become governors uh, of different states. Um, African Americans made gains and both for the first time. You also have a lot of what we know as historically black colleges established during this period of time also, like Fisk University, okay? Now, 1866, you're gonna have the Black Freeman Indian Treaty, all right? Now, this applied to the, the five, the so-called five civilized tribes of Native Americans, okay? The Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians. All right, now, Dr. Paul Anderson on his website, harvestinstitute.org, he has a really good article dealing with the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty and the, and the lawsuit that he uh, has had against the federal government since 2006 trying to get this enforced, all right? Now, what a lot of people don't know is that all five civilized tribes and Native Americans, and they call them civilized tribes because they agreed to adopt the ways of a white man, adopt Christianity, uh, stop hunting animals, start farming, things like this, to become more civilized, okay? Um, all five civilized tribes owned black slaves, okay? And when the Civil War was fought, they all fought on the side of the South to keep slavery intact because they didn't want to give up their slaves. Some of them, some of them are going to hold slaves up until 1866, 1867. They didn't want to give them up, okay? Invoke said, give it up, turn it loose. They didn't want to do that, all right? All right, so you have this Black Freeman Indian Treaty in 1866. Now, they've been pushed off their land because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. They're going out west. All five of them, they're going to Oklahoma. Um, be, there was, in the various treaties that they had with the U.S. government, there was a clause in the treaty that stated that it was, it was illegal for them to ever take up arms against the U.S. government. When they fought on the side of the Confederacy and fought against the Union, they violated their treaties. So before, before, the, before 1866, they had what were known as Indian territories. The Indian territories are taken back and then they're put on reservations. Okay? The, the Black Freeman Indian Treaty, what this did was this put them into a protected class. It gave them uh, a lot of benefits. Um, which would, which would later translate into free taxes, free college tuition. Uh, they can get things for free that other people have to compete for, so they get free TV licenses, they have TV stations, casino licenses, they have casinos, radio licenses, they have radio stations, things like this. Um, they, uh, they get about $3.5 billion in aid each year from the U.S. government. Dr. Anderson talked about this on my show, all right? Now, they, they were also given money to uh, distribute to their, former, to their slaves also because they had to turn them loose. That was one of the clauses of the, the, the Black Freedmen Indian Treaty in 1866, that they had to, give the, they, they had to turn their slaves loose, okay? Uh, they were also supposed to give the slaves land as well, the former slaves land, in their various territories. Now, this treaty applied to the five civilized tribes, it, it applied to their black slaves, it applied to the, the blacks in the Indian territories also, and it also applied to the descendants of those black slaves as well. The descendants, generation after generation, it applied to them also. To this day, you have Native Americans still benefiting from 
this treaty. But it has been what the descendants of those black slaves, the descendants of the black Indians also in those various tribes have not, for the most part, gotten the benefits. So this is what the lawsuit that Dr. Claude Anderson uh, has is about. Now, when we look at, um, let's see, okay, I'll come back to that in just a minute, all right? But I want to let people know about that. That's one of the best chances. People talk about reparations. That's one of the best chances right there to get it because that is law. And, and, and what, what Dr. Anderson's lawsuit, what he's saying is, is how do you honor this for one group of people that's specified in the treaty, but you totally disregard it for another group of people specified in the treaty? And he said he's talked to all the people in the Congressional Black Caucus. He can only get one person to spend any time listening to it. That's Maxine Waters. Nobody else wanted to hear about it. They don't understand the history. They think you're begging for something, something like this. Okay? Um, let me share a little bit of it. Everybody all right? Yeah. All right, let me share a little bit of this with you. And, and, and this article is called Harvest Institute Freedmen Federation Lawsuit and the 1866 Indian Treaties. Okay, this is on his website, harvestinstitute.org. So you can, you can read it there. Um, remember, what you do for yourself is based upon what you think about yourself. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, The Miseducation of the Negro, 1933. He said, in the schools of business administration, Negroes are trained excessively in the psychology and economics of Wall Street and are therefore made to despise the opportunities to run ice wagons, push banana carts, and sell peanuts among their own people. Foreigners who have not studied economics but have studied Negroes take up this business and grow rich. He said this in 1933. Okay? So this brother was dropping this back. That's a deep book, The Miseducation of the Negro. All right, now, when we look at Black Wall Street, okay? We talked about the Trail of Tears, 1838, Indian Removal Act, these five civilized tribes going into Oklahoma, all right? You have an area that's called Tallahassee, and around 1834, the Creek Indians, they call it Tallahassee, they settle this area and they take their black slaves with them, all right? Tallahassee later becomes, around um, uh, later in the uh, 1800s, it becomes known as Tulsi Town, and then it gets incorporated into a, a municipality January 18th. 1898, and it's called Tulsa, T-U-L-S-A. But that comes from Talasi, which is, a, a, I believe, a Creek Indian word because it's settled by the Creek. But they're taking their black slaves in there with them, all right? Now, what happens is, when they take their black slaves in there, when, because of that Black Freedmen Indian Treaty, their black slaves get land. They get between 40 to 100 acres of land, all right? And they pull their land together and they start forming communities, all right? These are some of the early black people living in what later we know as Tulsa, Oklahoma, all right? And they get that land from the Black Freedmen India Treaty that is still law today, but not being enforced for us, but it's being enforced for the white Indians. Early on, it was being enforced, okay? And that lays your foundation for what we later know as Black Wall Street, all right? now. Um, in 1905, the, uh, uh, Greenwood starts with the, uh, the, you have the Greenwood, what's known as the Greenwood District, the intersection of Greenwood Avenue and Archer Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, became the beginning of the uh, black business district that we call Black Wall Street. You have Tulsa that's divided into a white section and the black section. What divides them is the railroad <coughs> track. The black section is called North Tulsa. The white section, South Tulsa. Okay? Like huh? It's still kind of like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're not moving the railroad track. No. No. <laughs> so, yeah. So, the black section is North Tulsa. The business district in that black section is known as the Greenwood District because of Greenwood Avenue. And the beginning of, that green, the, beginning of the business district, district is the intersection of Greenwood and Archer Street. Okay? Uh, one of the first businesses there, it's not the first business, was a grocery store owned by O.W. Gurley, and he also owned a one-story rooming house as well, okay? Now, oil is discovered in Oklahoma, as well as Tulsa, about 1905, okay? And Oklahoma becomes the number one oil-producing state in the country, and Tulsa is booming with oil, 
all right? And this starts to attract a lot of people across the, across the country, a lot of people to Oklahoma, a lot of people to Tulsa. Now, you're going to have what are called boosters, and one of the most successful boosters was a man, uh, an African American man named Edwin P. McCabe, who comes from Kansas City. Now, what the boosters did was they would market Tulsa and the opportunities in Tulsa to other people, and especially African Americans, because we, we were facing, you know, rapid racism in the South. I think you have your hand up, sister. No, okay, rapid racism, ra rapid racism in the South. Things like this. We're looking for a better way of life. So a lot of us are going to go into Tulsa looking for a better way of life. Also in, in, also in Oklahoma, you're going to find that you had uh, some other all-black communities, also all-black towns, things like this, okay? So, um, if you read um, the book by Hannibal Johnson, Black Wall Street, from riot to renaissance in the historic Greenwood district, they break, they break, break this stuff down, okay? Um, now, here is some of the, uh, you have about 600 businesses, you're going to have about 600 businesses in Black Wall Street, around 600. You have a 35 uh, block district known as the Greenwood District or what later becomes known as the Negro Wall Street. It's believed it was given that name by Booker T. Washington and later known as Black Wall Street, okay? You have about uh, 21 churches, 21 restaurants, 30 grocery stores, two movie theaters, six private airplanes, uh, one hospital, one bank, they had their own school system. You read about Booker T. Washington uh, School, uh, which is the high school there. Um, you're going to have multimillionaires that live in Black Wall Street also, African American multimillionaires. Now, you also have a Native American population that lives in Black Wall Street as well. The majority, African American, yes. But you also have a Native American population that lives there, which makes sense because it was settled by Creek Indians. Okay? which were one of the five civilized tribes. All right, now, um, some, some other things that a lot of people don't know uh, about Black Wall Street is that even though you had a lot of successful businesses uh, and a lot of wealthy people there, everybody that lived, all the African Americans that lived in Black Wall Street were not, they didn't have it going on. Some of them worked for white people, okay? When you, when you actually read and study this information, you're going to find that the majority of the businesses we, we have only employed a handful of people. You're going to have some get employed more people, but the majority of them have uh, employed a handful of people. And then also, in South Tulsa, where the white people live, you're going to have uh, a lot of their domestics, a lot of their maids and things like this, that had living quarters next to the, the, the white people's house or what have you. And Thursday was known as Maid's Day Off or Maid's Night Off. So on Thursday, a lot of these maids will go into uh, the, the, the business district, Greenwood, Black Wall Street, and spend money, okay? Um, so you're going to have them making money off of that. Um, but every, uh, even though it was, they, they were very successful, African Americans, things like this, you had some of them that went into um, uh, South Tulsa and were domestic work for white people also. We're going to see this when the race riot happens. Because one of the things that happens during the race rides is that a lot of them are put into concentration camps. Okay? How many people knew about that? No. I know the system in the back does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would you repeat that, please? What part? Would you please repeat what you just said? About the concentration camps? Yes. Would you say? When, when the, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But when the race riot happens, uh, a lot of the blacks, because you have some that flee. But the ones that are left, they're going to be rounded up and put in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. So... What started the race riot? All right, so you have an incident taking place May 30, 1921. You have this 19-year-old shoeshine boy called, uh, named Dick Rowland, also known as Diamond Dick. Um, he was uh, shining shoes, and they had uh, the, his, his, his boss had an uh, agreement with a, a nearby uh, office building that um, his shoeshine boys could use the bathroom there. So he gets on the elevator to go up to the top, uh, the top floor, use the bathroom. And the, according to reports and a lot of documentaries, things like this, the elevator uh, shifts or something, he loses his balance and he reaches out to, you know, reaches out to grab something to stabilize himself. The, the elevator operator was a 17 year old white girl named Sarah Page, okay? And when that happens, she, she screams. He gets scared and runs away. One of the nearby workers comes to her aid or something like this, but he runs away. 
And when um, the police get involved, uh, she initially says that uh, he tried to assault her, but later she recants that story. And he's arrested the next day, okay? <coughs> May 31st, Tuesday, 1921, Dick Rowland is picked up by the police. He's arrested. You have uh, a newspaper article. You, now, you have, the, you have a white newspaper, a couple white newspapers there, and you have an African-American newspaper in, in North Tulsa, and you have a white newspaper in South Tulsa, okay? You're going to have uh, the white newspaper put out an a, 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 a editorial uh, with the title, something to the effect of, to lynch Negro tonight. You have the uh, white newspapers that are really inciting uh, violence and inciting a mob. Now, it's important to understand that the role the Ku Klux Klan played in this because with these white men coming back from the war, you know, World War I ends in 1918. Um, they come back, it's hard for them to find jobs, and the Ku Klux Klan recruits a lot of them because the Klan is explaining to them that it's those black people in uh, North Tulsa, and they call it, it's the Europeans that call it Little Africa. They call it that as a demeaning word, or they call it nigger town also. That's another word they have for it, okay? Uh, it's actually North, it, it was actually called North Tulsa. He say it's because of them, this is why you don't have a job. So this built up a lot of hatred also, and this allowed the Klan to recruit a lot of people, and in and, and, and Tulsa, the uh, Klan membership was somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 men. Okay, in Tulsa. Now, in North Tulsa, where the African Americans were, you only had about 11,000 African Americans in, in 1921 there. Okay? So, uh, Dick Rowland is arrested. You have newspaper articles going out inciting people. And some of the African Americans get word that some white men are going to go and try to uh, break Dick Rowland out. So, you, get, you have a group of about 200 black men arms that go to the jail to back up the sheriff to keep him from being taken out. Sheriff McCullough is the sheriff's name, okay? Um, you're going to have a race riot that ensues as an account of a, uh, somebody, a white person that's deputized trying to take a gun from a, a former World War I veteran. He had a, uh, a pistol. They try to take a gun from him and the gun goes off, all hell breaks loose. Uh, but you're going to have an invasion in Black Wall Street. You're going to have about 500 white men deputized, a lot of them are Klansmen. You're eventually going to have about, uh, estimates show between 10,000 and 15,000 white people invading Tulsa. Okay? Uh, there, there's, uh, one documentary on this is, uh, well, you have uh, Before They Die, okay? And uh, Vicky's father was in there, right? He was in there, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Before They Die. Yeah, Before They Die. And then there's another one called, uh, I got it here, yeah, I'll find it. There are a few documentaries out. The Before They Die is really good. There's another one the, There's another one called The Tulsa Lynching of 1921, A Hidden Story. Okay? That's a really good one also. All right? But um, what happens is a part of the story that's not told is that African Americans fought back also. Okay, because you had retired World War I veterans that lived in North Tulsa also in the Greenwood District as well. And they had guns and ammunition. They knew how to fight. They helped build this up this community and they fought back also. Okay. Um, it's uh, eventually what's gonna happen, you're gonna have about twelve hundred homes destroyed, uh, about three hundred homes looted, over four thousand people uh, were homeless. Uh, I've seen estimates as many as ten thousand homeless. Um, you, you, the Red Cross estimates that about 300 people were killed, but we know it's, it's most likely more than that. The reason why is because, number one, some people were shot and wounded, and they ran into neighboring cities and died there. And then also there were reports of black bodies being dumped into the river also. Okay? So it's hard to get an estimate, but we know at least 300, at least 300 were killed. Um, because homes were destroyed, you're going to end up with about 1,000 African Americans living in tents uh, during the winter. 